They don't just have a valet. They have a VIP valet. Hey guys, what's up? Max here. And uh, just getting back into the office, Larissa and I took a little vacation. It was a mini vacation. We went down to uh, Key Biscayne, which is this little, uh, this little island that's uh, southeast of Miami, um, about like 15 minutes over the bridge. It's really nice, super small island, just beautiful and relaxing. And we had such an amazing time. And uh, there's obviously a lot of things that you learn on vacation. So you go on vacation and you kind of expect like, I'm just gonna disconnect. I'm not really gonna think about anything business related. I'm not gonna think about anything marketing related, all that good stuff. Um, but ironically, here's what's interesting. Like when you're hyper-focused on work, right? So when you're super focused on like my job, so every day, you know, you go into the office, you're building ads, you're doing things, uh, you know, you're kind of doing the same tasks over and over again. Your brain kind of gets put into this uh, routine mode, right? Where it's like, I, I just do this every day, it's the same thing. I don't really need to use my creative forces. It's kind of just muscle memory, right? It's the same reason why if you're driving to work every day, there's some days where you just end up at the office in the parking lot and you won't really know how you got there, right? Um, so what I find is when I'm like going to bed, when, uh, what's up, Timothy? What's up, guys? I find when I'm going to bed, when I'm on vacation, those are the times where I have the best ideas. So I'll usually like a notebook, right? I usually write stuff down because my brain's kind of free to wander, right? Like it's not really focused on anything. Because of that, it can kind of just be creative and just think in an unconstrained environment. So I figured, hey, let me share an observation. And it may be an obvious one. It may be a... Um, it may be something that everyone's just like, that's an obvious thing. But if it was obvious, we would be seeing a lot better ads um, in our feeds, right? So I, I don't think it's that obvious or it's either obvious and everyone's choosing to ignore it, which is just as scary. So here's what I noticed. So Larissa and I, we go to Miami. Um, we go to Kibis Kane, right? And anybody, um, what's up, Mark? How's it going? It's great to, uh, to see you as well. So anybody, and I'm super pumped up this week too, because I got, uh, we got Endgame coming out. Larissa just ordered me this sweet Infinity Gauntlet shirt. Um, we got some sweet Avengers gear, so I'm super pumped for that. So this is a good week for me. I'm really excited about it. As a huge superhero fan, back from vacation, ready for Endgame, couldn't get any better Easter weekend, all that good stuff. Um, if you've been to Miami, you know that Miami, you know, I've been, I've been to a lot of places around the world. Um, I've been to you know, Paris and London and Bangkok and, you know, pretty much Hawaii and everyone you can think of, uh, Vegas, like, but I think Vegas, LA and Miami are probably the three places, at least in the US, where, well, where people, uh, their superficial appearance and how they put themselves out there matters more than anything else in the world. Um, <laughs> so like, we're driving the island and um, we just got, I just got Larissa a new, new car. We just got a new, a new SUV. And it's like everybody there has, makes you feel inferior, right? So everyone has a, um, a Cayenne, so Porsche Cayenne. Everyone there has a Range Rover. Everyone there has an Audi, some nice SUV. Um, but then there's like Lamborghini just came out with an SUV, the Urus, which is freaking sick. I, I want to get one. It's, it's incredible. Maybe, maybe a year from now, two years from now, we'll get one. But after dinner, and we're, you know, we just parked and literally like four or five Euruses come by in like a five minute period, right? There's race, there's, it's so much, such a concentration of wealth in such a small area. And the demographic there, because it's, it's much younger, it's much more flashy than most places, right? There's a lot of wealthy people in a lot of cities in a lot of countries, right? But Miami, it's so in your face. Right? You can't avoid it. You walk anywhere in Miami in the surrounding area and you're guaranteed to see a Lamborghini. You're guaranteed to see a Rolls Royce. You're guaranteed to see a Ferrari. Right? BMWs and Mercedes are just like, that's the average car there. Right? And, um, and so what I started realizing is like, well, first of all, a lot of the people that are, are driving around 
don't own these cars. Um, a lot of it, there's rent, the rental business in Miami for luxury cars is off, off the chain. Like it, there's so much money being made in that market for luxury car rentals. It's a really lucrative business if you do it right. So there's a ton of companies. There's like dozens, I Googled it. Um, like rental, you know, rent a Urus in, uh, in Miami. Um, cause I was talking to Larissa, let's do it for the day. It'd be fun. Um, and there's just so many options, right? So it got me thinking though about how important What's up, John? How's it going? But how important that first appearance is, that first interaction, right? And when you go to Miami, that's what you see. Everywhere you go, it's like people invest so much time and so much money into that initial interaction, right? Because they want to pull up and pay $40 for the VIP valet. So at, at um, Prime 112, which one of the steakhouse we went to, they don't just have a valet. They have a VIP valet, right? So the guy asked me, hey, sir, we, you know, it's $20 to valet, but if you have VIP valet, just $40 and we'll keep your car out front, right? And, and you only see that in Miami. Like out of all the places I've been to, that's the one place where they have like a second tier of valet just to show off your car. Um, but you go around and it's everyone there at night, it's, it's carefully crafted, the outfit they're wearing, the, the bag they have, the shoes they're wearing, the watch they're wearing, the car they're driving, where they go, everything is so calculated because that is so important to so many people is their appearance, how people see them the first time they meet them. And, um, and you know, part of me is like disgusted by that. Part of me is like, that's, you know, not a way you should be living your life, but everyone's free to live the, the life they want to live. And that's what's great about this country is that we can live, you know, we can be different um, and, and still have respect for each other. But part of me is like, well, most of these people shouldn't be driving a Lamborghini. They shouldn't have the things they have. I'm sure they are, are stretched very, very thin. They probably have no savings. They're not investing in anything. They're investing all their money and they're superficial and, and what people see um, when they first meet them. The other part of me though, say, as, a, as a marketer, like, this is fairly uh, accurate in terms of how consumers and just people uh, perceive other things. So we make, as human beings, judgments very, very quickly. When we meet somebody, we make a decision about whether we like this person or don't like this person pretty quickly, right? Um, and and it, we hate to admit it, but that's the truth, right? When you're at a networking event and somebody comes up to you, and they start off by like, you know, pitching their business. You're, you're instantly turned off, right? It's gonna be very, very difficult for that person to, to navigate the conversation back into you giving that person a chance. So like when I go to events and speak and stuff, when people come up to me and the first thing they ask me, first thing they're doing is like, you know, pitching a business, pitching an idea, talking about themselves. I instantly tune them out. I've instantly made a decision in my head that um, you know this person is not worth the time to talk to. This is what they're going to be like now. The rest of the conversations, this is what they're starting with, and and that's you know the reality is that we do make those judgments. We do make those split second decisions when we meet people. That first interaction, that first sentence, the way somebody looks, the way somebody dresses, the way they walk up to you, the way they greet you, all of that is is analyzed, interpreted, and a decision comes out on the other end. So what's interesting to me is if we take that aspect of, you know, our kind of neurology and, and, and the neuroscience behind it of, of how our brains work and how we, um, you know, determine whether we like or don't like people and that, and obviously this is not a fact, right? There's plenty of times you meet people and you get a bad first impression and they redeem themselves, right? I, I know plenty of people that I like now that maybe I didn't, we didn't hit it off a first interaction. Um, However, most consumers, that, that's a peer-to-peer -peer relationship, right? That's like a human-to-human -human relationship. Most consumers are not that forgiving when it comes to a brand or a business or an advertiser, right? You're already, um, you're already interrupting them. You're already causing a negative experience because your advertisement is disrupting what they're doing on the platform they're using, right? So your ads interrupting their Spotify song, your ads interrupting their podcast, your ads interrupting the YouTube video they're watching, your ads interrupting their puppy videos they're looking at. Any way you cut it, your ad is disrupting that person's experience. So you're, they're already a little upset before they even interact with you. And so now if you're, um, 
if your first interaction with them is to sell them some stuff, to talk about how cool you are, how great you are, how much money you make, any of that, think about how somebody's perceiving that and the decisions they're making about whether they like or don't like you, right? So when I scroll through my feed, I'm scrolling through, I'm scrolling through, I'm scrolling through, and it just, it's ad after ad after ad of selling. And a lot of them are from businesses or individuals that I've never interacted with before. I've never been to their website. I've never watched content of theirs. I'm not on their email list. This is my first interaction with them. This is my nice to meet you. I'm Max Finn. Here's what I sell interaction, right? And they're starting it off with a pitch, with a sell. And, um, and most people are making decisions right there that I don't like this person. They don't even know you yet, but they're saying they don't like you. They might love your product. They might love your service. They might need your product and need your service desperately, but you have ruined that first interaction. And because you've ruined it, it's going to be really, really difficult to change their mind, right? If they even give you a second shot. And so it's, um, it was just an interesting observation that I had when I was there. And I'm curious if it's something that other people agree with, right? When you go out, when you're, when you're at an event, when you're scrolling through your feed, are you making um, decisions about whether you like somebody or don't like somebody or like a brand or don't like a brand within that first interaction? Is that something that is consistent with kind of a lot of people? I, I believe it is because I've talked to a lot of people and this is the way I, you know, I act and I think. Um, but I'm genuinely curious if that's something that's kind of consistent. Um, it seems like it is. Like Brian was saying, it's, you know, it happens every time to me, get network with people, they start pitching. And it's true. And that, like, that's why, um, that's why I, I hate going to events, frankly. Um, networking events I, I, are just, the whole premise of it is flawed. Because you're bringing a bunch of people together who all need things. And they're all slightly desperate. And because of that, they want to rush right? If you're unemployed or your business is struggling or whatever it might be, you have a, an urgent need to get a result. And because of that, you're not willing to put in the work to build a relationship, right? The, the, the right way to market, and I was um, Jack Paxson, a friend of mine who runs Viper, we had an interview yesterday. Um, we did a live training and we were kind of talking about gamification and Facebook ads and the future of that. And he said, you know, a, a fact, which is a true fact, which is that uh, it, it takes about four to eight touch points to convince somebody to pull the trigger, pull their wallet out of their, their pocket and buy something, right? Um, and that could be a lot more depending on your price point or your product or industry, right? So I know it's so tempting to rush and it's so tempting, especially if you're struggling and especially if you're in a tough place and you're not making money or you're unemployed or whatever it might be that I need to make a sale I need to close today. But the reality is that you're going to do so much damage to your reputation, to things that once they're damaged are almost impossible to repair by shooting for a short-term goal. And the chances of you accomplishing that short-term goal with that strategy are, are slim to none anyway, slim to none anyway. So, you know, going into 2019 and, and looking at what does marketing look like from today on, and this is the way it should have been. I mean, this is the way really the best marketers and best businesses have been doing it for years, um, and even longer than that, is to foster relationships, to ensure that your initial interaction, your initial touch point with a prospective consumer is nothing more than relationship building, entertainment, engagement, value add. If you're doing anything other than that, you are rolling the dice, you are taking a big risk, and sure, you might get some people to bite and some people to buy and some people to pull the trigger, right? You're gonna, if you have a great product, you might be able to make that happen. But the risk is so high because like I said, once you get known as that super salesy guy or that super spammy business, that's a, that's a reputation. You only have one reputation. Um, you only have one life. And, and once you destroy that, it is gone. Like it's what's so fascinating to me um, like Dan Henry just posted on, he just shared on his, his feed 
about somebody stealing one of his ads. And I just, I told him, you know, I, somebody happened to me like two weeks ago, somebody did the exact same thing to me. And I've been hearing it more and more from different marketers that I know, like seeing their ads getting stolen, seeing their landing page getting stolen. And it's incredible to me that anybody would do this beyond the fact that it's just not gonna work for you because my ad copy for my personal brand is written by me and it's, a, it's, it's who I am, talking about Batman and stuff. It doesn't fit you. It's totally, there's a disconnect there and people can sense that. But on top of that, like if you want to be a successful marketer and you want to do info products and all that stuff, like you're going to need speaking gigs. You're going to need to build community. You're going to need to have, you know, high, high level partners and affiliates. And if you get known as the person that steals shit or the person that's super spammy or the person that just sells, sells, sells and doesn't foster community or doesn't give, right? Nobody's going to want to work with you. And then you have no shot, right? Because then you're just a lone wolf by yourself. Nobody wants to help you. Nobody wants to support you. And trust me, people talk, right? I get asked on a regular basis by people that I trust, hey, what do you think about this guy? What do you think about this person? Um, we're thinking about maybe partnering with them or hiring them or retaining their agency or, or being an affiliate for them. What do you think? And I can tell you there's been several times where people reach out to me with names that I know, like, I don't trust these people. And I've told them flat out and they've made a decision not to work with that person because of it. So, um, so kind of like rolling it back, right, to the, to the point of this video. I think it is so critical to play a bigger game and to think big picture, right? If you talk to any great chess player, if you talk to any great general politician, if you look at throughout history at the greatest military leaders throughout history, if you look at Genghis Khan and Napoleon and Caesar, and, and you look at this list of people who have just accomplished incredible things, whether they were bad people or good people, they, they accomplished great things um, or, or incredible things, they didn't plan one step ahead. They didn't like put together a game plan to win a battle, right? Like Napoleon was famous. And I know we're, we're getting down this, this avenue here. I just go on tangents. It, that's just what I do. Um, Napoleon was infamous for knowing and telling people where the war was going to end. Like he had this gift where he could sit, he had on the, on his floor, they had this massive map when he would go, when they would have wars and stuff. And he was able to say, this is where the last battle is going to be. And that's where the last battle will be. And so he would basically lay up and like lay, like stay up all night and think of every possible outcome. Hey, if this person attacks here and we counterattack here and this reinforcements don't get here, this is what this person will do. And then we'll do this. Okay. If we charge over here and this person doesn't defend, this is what we'll do. And he had everything mapped out because he didn't give a crap if he was going to win a battle. He cared about winning wars. He cared about the big picture and everything he did was about the big picture, right? And, um, and so I, I think it's important as marketers or as entrepreneurs or whatever we are, like, whatever you're doing to follow the example of people that have paved history and like people that we study and that have made such a giant mark in history that books are written about them, um, that if you're thinking one week out, one month out, you are going to fail. If you are playing the game to make a few dollars today and you're sacrificing making hundreds of dollars, thousands of dollars, six months from now, one year from now, you are going to lose. It just doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. Facebook no longer, um, if they ever did, but especially today, they do not want advertisers like that on the platform. They want advertisers who enhance the user experience who create valuable ads experiences, right? So they're not just selling, they're entertaining, they're engaging, they're valuable, they, they're educational, they, they help the user, they make the experience for the user that much better, they keep the user on the platform, they keep the user engaged on the platform. These are all things that are now so critical. And so, um, so like we're spending just a lot of time, top of funnel, relationship building, right? Putting out tons of videos. I, you know, like, sure, we could get more leads if I drove all this cold traffic to a webinar page and had an auto webinar with a fake timer and fake counter and all that crap, right? But I'm just going to put the video on Facebook, right? So right now to cold audiences, if you're like, you just might have seen the ad, like I just took my post purchase retargeting webinar, a webinar that I spent months working. I cut out the sale. I cut out the intro. I took the content. I uploaded it to Facebook. Here you go. I took the same webinar. I mean, I took another big webinar we did. Here you go. 
Sure, if you're thinking short-sighted, you may be like, Max, that's stupid, why would you do that? You can get leads, you can be selling on the webinar, you can do all these, doing all these things. But I'm not playing the one week, one month game. We're playing the, the game of building a serious company, not a company that's gonna do a few million dollars. We wanna build a company that's doing tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, right? And, um, and you don't do that by nickel and diming. You don't do that by trying to take, 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 take from your leads, from your cold traffic, from your customers. You do that by over-delivering. You do that by, um, if you look at this kind of like as a seesaw, right? Where when it's even, that means there's an equal value exchange where the consumer and the business feel like there's an equal amount of value being given. You do that by early on making it totally lopsided. So me as the brand, as the product, I wanna give so much, so frequently to those people that have not bought from me yet, that don't know me yet. So by the time I do ask for something, by the time I do make a request, they feel so compelled to do it because they feel it's almost unfair that they've gotten all this stuff for free and they haven't paid for it yet. They haven't given anything yet. Um, Cause it, it's just, it's, um, I find a lot of marketers and a lot of, of businesses right now that are doing a lot of paid traffic have continued to take for granted the value of an email. They continue to assume that consumers value an email address the same as they did a year ago or five years ago. And the truth is they don't. Just like the value of a dollar changes with inflation and deflation, the value of an email changes as well, right? So what's happened in the last year with user privacy, with government reg regulation, with transparency, all of this stuff has brought to light the value of an email for a lot of people. So a lot of people that before didn't really understand how valuable their email was dollar-wise, now know, well, hey, when I give this brand my email, they're making a lot of money with it. They might actually be selling it to these brands and making more money off of it. So what does that mean? That means now the same tricks I use to get an email, the same lead magnets I use, the crappy one, you know, one page cheat sheet, the crappy little ebook, the you know, crappy webinar that does more selling than teaching, that is not as valuable anymore. You need to stack the value, you need to give more if you're asking for an email, or you need to warm that prospect up way more before you do do the ask on the um, for the, the training. I just think it's, and this is just, you know, my opinion, and we'll call it a day after this, and you know, you can take it for what it's worth, you can disagree with it, and that, that's what's great, we can have these discussions and debates, people can disagree with everybody. Um, but I think when you're looking at like how I approach marketing and how we approach paid traffic and lead generation and everything, there are so many shortcuts, and there are so many things that it's easy for us to do because everyone's doing it, right? It's if, if you went to a store and you saw everybody in the store pickpocketing, if you saw everyone in the store kind of taking a candy bar and walking out, you would feel less guilty about taking a candy bar because everyone's taking a candy bar, right? Because it's group thing. It's like if that person's doing that person's doing it and they're not getting caught for it, hey, I'm gonna do it, it's, there's no repercussions. The same things happened with all this fake BS that we're seeing, the fake timers, the fake counters, the fake inventory trackers, the auto webinar that when you go to somebody's landing page says, hey, the next webinar starting in seven minutes. What a coincidence, right? Like that crap is just, it's so spammy, it's so beneath everybody, and frankly, more and more people are catching on to it, right? So I would rather be the exact opposite. I would rather call all that stuff out, be super transparent about it, and just give, right? Stop using the gimmicks and start giving value. Because that, that's the one thing that I know for a fact. Everyone's looking for the secret to success. Everyone's looking for that strategy, the blueprint that, hey, if I do this ad here and this ad here and I have this retargeting sequence and if I use this lookalike audience and if I set up this CBO structure with this manual bid and I set up these automation rules, that I'll be a millionaire. Everyone's looking for that, the exact pieces, right, that you put in place. There, there's no one size fits all thing out there, right? There's no one guaranteed formula that'll make you successful. There's too many variables for everyone's business. And anyone that says they can do that is full of crap and you shouldn't buy anything from them. What I do know is a formula for success is giving value, being who you are, being authentic, and focusing on delivering, helping, and, and relationship building over everything, right? I don't know a single person 
that has built a tribe that has given, 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 that has fostered relationships, deep, meaningful relationships, and has built an audience that is not successful. I don't know a single person that has done that, right? Because you, if you have a tribe of people that believe in you, that support you, that know you care about them, there's always ways to make money, right? There's always ways to monetize that. Um, and that's kind of counterintuitive to what most people do, which is build a list for as you know, little money as possible, burn it as hard as can, make as much money as you can from it, and then get another list. And that, that's what a lot of people are doing. Um, and sure, you can make money that way, but that's an exhausting model. That is a model where you have to consistently keep doing it. You have to keep doing it, keep doing it, keep putting more leads in, more leads in, keep changing domains, keep changing ESPs, keep cloaking, all that stuff, and it's exhausting, right? Um, everyone here is way too smart to be wasting that energy, that brain power on those things. They should be focused on giving, helping, and, and building something that's truly valuable to people. So that's my, um, for whatever that's worth, that's my two cents on uh, my takeaway from vacation was that that first, to, re to recap, that first impression that you make, right, that first interaction you make as a person or as a brand or as an advertiser is so critical and just know that people will make a judgment of whether they like or don't like you in that first interaction. So if your first interaction as an advertiser is to sell, be spammy, provide no value and ask, you will be judged. And people are judging brands that do that harsher than ever for doing that. So instead, make sure that first interaction is about relationship building, value add, give, give, give. Do not ask for something on that first interaction, right? Give them a video lesson, give them a webinar, give them a, a cheat sheet, give them whatever. Don't make them go to a landing page. Don't make them fill out a CTA form. Don't make them fill out a lead form. Don't make them do a messenger opt-in. Just give on that first interaction you will make so much more money and be so much more successful and you will feel so much better about it in the long run. Because at the end of the day, if you can't live with yourself, if you're disgusted by the way you make your money, I, you know, it might be easy for some people that do that to say I'm happy. I can promise you that having lots of toys and things because the money you made does not make you happy. What makes you happy is knowing that you're making an impact, that you're doing what you love, that you're having fun with what you do and that you know that your kids, your wife, your family, your friends are proud of what you're doing, are proud of the work you're doing, are proud of the impact that you're having. And that's what matters, at least to me. That, that's what I care about, that's what I value. And hopefully that's what everyone who watches this video also values um, and cares about. Doing things ethically, doing things the right way, making an impact, having fun, being happy. Otherwise, what's the point? right? It's uh, at the end of the day, what's, what's the point? And that's why I sent out that email when I was on vacation. I snuck a quick email um, about like how important just taking a vacation was. I spent years focused purely on making money. Years, my like bulk of my 20s on money. That was what drove me. That's what I focused on. That was what I tied my happiness to. And I was not happy most of my 20s. I was depressed. It was driving me insane. I was so stressed. I would have times where I would just like break down and cry, right? It was really, really tough. And once I stopped doing that, once I started focusing on being happy, doing what I love, enjoying my life, taking more time off, disconnecting from work more, like sh shifting the business so I can put things that I don't like doing off my plate and have other team members do that so I can focus on teaching, coaching, sharing, creating content, doing this, which is what I love doing and have fun doing, all of a sudden my happiness went like this. And you know, it's interesting, not only did I get happier, I'm, I'm having more fun, I'm more relaxed than I've ever been, we're also making more money doing that. And that's not a coincidence, right? When you do things that you love, when you're passionate about it, when you're having fun, you end up, end up actually making more money. And, uh, and that's the, the challenge, right? When you chase money, you sometimes struggle to make money. When you don't chase money, you end up making more money. And, and it's hard to wrap your head around that, how that happens. Um, but I'm a, I'm a believer that that's a real thing that does happen. And um, so yeah. I hope everyone had a great Easter weekend. I hope everyone got to take some time off. It's so important. And at the end of the day, if, if you don't take time off, then there's no point in working so hard. It's just, what, what's the, the gain, right? What's the upside? Is that we get to you know work weekends for the rest of our life and not take time off, not take vacations off, and not get to enjoy um, the, the fruits of our labor. 
So hopefully everyone enjoyed that video. Let me know, hit the like button, uh, drop a comment in there if you agree with this, if you agree with first impressions being so important, or if you disagree, I would love to hear that as well. If you think that they're not important, I'd love to hear your opinion as well. So just drop a comment, let me know if uh, you think somebody needs to hear this, if you think there's a marketer or a business owner that you see not doing this, that you see them being too salesy and spammy, go ahead and share this, right? Tag them, people need to know. And it's not a bad thing, we make mistakes as long as we recognize we're making mistakes and change that's all we can do. Um, so again, hope you guys had an awesome, awesome Easter weekend. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you on the next video. Thanks.